In 2015, a documentary film was made about Canarsie. It described experiences by longtime residents, local merchant history, as well as civil service, tourism, and a few hotel structures that still survive. I wanted to give a description of the tourism business that flourished and paved the way for the 100 hotels of Canarsie to be built. In order to understand the scale of this industry that Canarsie had, we have to look at the commerce that once existed there. Canarsie has been mentioned in several books as being a quiet fishing village, and that can be more further from the actual truth. In 1868, a newspaper reported, thousands of people visit Canarsie for a breath of fresh air or a dip in the bay, on which occasion it is quite refreshing to notice what a seaside-ish air, a flat-crowned hat with flapping sides tied under the chin, gives ladies who renew their bloom of their roses by a weekly trip to Canarsie, unquote. Thousands of people came to the suburbs of Canarsie for sportsmen's activities, yacht races, great food, and the beach. Its first hotel was, was recorded as the 1853 Jones Hotel located on East 92nd between J and Flatlands. Now East 92nd Street wasn't always called East 92nd Street. As a matter of fact, it was originally known as One Common Highway. It dates back to 1704 and was originally a Native American trail that was used in Canarsie. Canarsie and Flatlands were both the same area known as the 32nd Ward. Flatlands was mainly undeveloped and Canarsie was the center of commerce with its seafood industry. Many people came to Canarsie via the steam locomotive and through ferry service. In 1866, the steam train line initiated a ferry service offering folks a different way of getting to Canarsie. Steamships such as the Rockaway in 1866, the Carry in 1869, the Erastus Corning Jr. in 1871, and the Oceanus in 1870. These ships provided thousands of tourists whom reciprocated by providing commerce and supporting Canarsie's economy. In 1888, the Canarsie Steamboat Company was introduced by Richard McAvoy and William Warner to compete with local excursion companies. On August 12, 1895, the news reported that 60,000 people visited Canarsie, with 30,000 being brought in via the steam train and another 30,000 brought in via the steam vessels like the aforementioned Hazel Kirk and others by the Granite City Steamers which was owned by the Nassau Electric Railroad. In August 26, 1895, the Granite City Line was bought out by the Canarsie Steamboat Company. In 1899, a large steamship named the General Slocum carried thousands. Another line of steamers was called the Adams Line after Harry Adams. After the railroad discontinued the ferry in 1905, other companies continue to provide the service. Other ferry service that brought passengers to other points from Canarsie were the 1905 Arthur McAvoy to the Roxbury Hotel located in the Rockaways, the William Warner to Bergen Beach, the F. Bogle to Bergen Beach, and the F. Langston to Rockaway Park. In 1906, a ferry steamer connected folks from Sheepshead Bay to Canarsie. That line was called the P. Howard Reed. Now, Canarsie was self-sustained and was the very last holdout to join the city of Brooklyn in 1896, when all of the other Brooklyn neighborhoods had already been part of Brooklyn for a while. Which is why when you research Brooklyn history, Flatlands and Canarsie is never found because it was not part of Brooklyn prior to 1896. That of course only lasted for two years because in 1898, Brooklyn then became a borough and joined New York City. 
Now let's talk about the steam locomotives. Construction began in April of 1864. The line opened in, eight, in October of 1865 as the Brooklyn and Rockaway Beach Railroad. This line would transport folks from East New York to Canarsie. This line was able to connect passengers with a horse car line that went from Jamaica, Queens, downtown Fulton, and Atlantic Avenue. Also in 1865, the railroad constructed a dock, subsequently rebuilt and enlarged at the tip of Canarsie Point to handle coal and lumber. Another horse car line was added in 1866, connecting Bergen residents to Canarsie. In addition, a steamboat called the Rockaway allowed passengers to get off at Canarsie Landing and take the steam ferry to the Rockaways where a resort known as Seaside Park and House awaited in 1866. Expenses by 1891 to operate this ferry cost $9,131. In 1867, the locomotive line carried 12,567 passengers. Now that you understand exactly how people got to Canarsie, let's talk about the Canarsie seafood industry. Now, Canarsie originally was considered three sections. The part closest to today's train station, extending to Avenue D, that was originally just called Canarsie. The section between Flatlands Avenue and Avenue M was called Canarsie Grove. The section between Seaview Avenue and the shore was called Canarsie Landing. There were hotels in all three sections, although two-thirds of them were at the Canarsie Landing by the water. At the landing, the oyster planting beds consisted of 158 owners who owned approximately 232 acres of planting beds in Jamaica Bay which at the time was called Flatlands Bay. The, plant, the planting beds stretched from Canarsie Landing all the way to Ruffle Bar. Now papers have said that the industry made between two million a year and as high as 10 million a year. Now, if you take the lower number, two million a year in 1900 is equal to about $60 million. Now that to me does not sound like a quiet fishing village at all. Now if you look back at 1850, uh, there were 75 fishermen living, living in Canarsie and there were 191 farmers. By 1880, there were 190 fishermen that lived in Canarsie. At that time, the town board gave each resident of Canarsie an opportunity to mine the rich waters for planting clam beds and clam digging by giving them one to three acres of marshland for oyster planting. One of those oystermen was named Colonel Sellers. By 1883, Canarsie's Republican Congressman Archibald Bliss put in legislation to build a dam to form a new channel one and a half mile long at a cost of $18,000. The bill also gave each oysterman six acres of planting beds. By 1897, these acre divisions led to quarrels, which resulted in Jamaica Bay being divided into three separate bays. They were renamed Flatlands Bay, Flatbush Bay, and Jamaica Bay. The industry that had its seafood dis distributed via an eel market that was established in the late 1700s on Cherry Street and South Streets. They were part of where the Brooklyn Bridge now stands. Vessels brought the seafood over there. Some fishermen like Eli Abrams shipped his oysters to the Fulton Fish Market to the Blackford Company. Henry Lankenau also had a place of business at the Fulton Fish Market. Walter C. Denton hauled, hauled his oysters and clams and supplied fish markets throughout Brooklyn. 
George A. Carmen shipped out his mussels, and Henry W. Schmelk shipped his oysters. Another fisherman was Charles H. Seaman, who had a stand in the Fulton Fish Market. Break. Now we're going to name all of the hotels that were in Canarsie, but first we're going to begin with this 1883 article. Quote, other pleasure resorts have sprung in and faded away, but Canarsie is still queen of sportsmen's resorts. She has witnessed the growth of Rockaway Beach and has beheld Coney Island spring into existence as though Aladdin had conjured it with his wonderful lamp but she has ever maintained her old-time steady position as a fisherman's village, situated on the northwestern edge of Canarsie Bay with a broad expanse of water spreading to the south and west. She is in such a position that in time to come, and that at no very distant way, she bids fair to be one of the most prosperous places in the country. Her water is unequaled. So, Un end quote. Uh, Canarsie was destined for greatness, and as a promising tourism industry was coming along, the community had to brace for success. Okay, so now we're going to go into the hotels. Now, the first one I had mentioned previously was the 1853 Jones Hotel. We're going to go through from 1850 to 1873. Uh, you had uh, Derlin's Hotel, and uh, you had Skidmore's Hotel, you had the Fisher's Hotel. Lehman's Hotel, which was on Conklin and East 95th, that was owned by August D. Lehman. The Richardson Hotel, the Hotel Victor, that was owned by Victor Voris. The Canarsie Pavilion Hotel, that was owned by DeWitt C. Littlejohn, who was one of the, uh, the guys, one of the partners that uh, implemented and put together the Canarsie Railroad. Uh, the Oceanus House in 1867, that was located on Rockaway Avenue, that was owned by John McFall. Uh, you had the Canarsie Depot Hotel, Uncle Sam's Cabin, uh, that was facing J uh, Jamaica Bay, that was owned by J.D. Whitaker. You had the Bayview House Hotel, which was in many reports known as Canarsie's largest hotel. It was a three-story hotel and had a balcony that wrapped around each floor. Uh, that was run by uh, Tom Stewart. Then you had King's Hotel, uh, that was owned by Richard Jones, and the Fife Hotel and Beer Hall on East 92nd Street. Moving on to 1878 to 1885, you had Bub Clark's Hotel. You had the Chris Craft Hotel that was on Rockway between 95th and East 96th Street. Uh, Wimpheimer's Hotel, Avenue L and East 95th. Uh, the Deal Hotel at 1465 Rockaway Parkway, 1465. Uh, a lot of you may remember that uh, you had the Rebel Attorney at Law located right there, that, that same building that Rebel and Rebel uh, was in uh, in the 80s and 90s, that used to be a hotel back in 1881. That was owned by John D. Deal. Uh, you had the Chris Craft Hotel on Rockaway between 95th and 96th. Freeman's Hotel. You had Lemkin's Hotel in 1885. That was on Conklin near uh, uh, East 95th. And then you had Miller's Hotel. Moving on to 1889 through 1895, you had Cook's Hotel at the shore. You had William, uh, excuse me, William Van Ahen's Hotel at the Grove at, on, on, at uh, Avenue M and East 93rd. The McFall Hotel between 92nd M and N, again, Canarsie Grove area. Willits Hotel, uh, Grand Ocean Hotel at the shore. Crystal Hotel at Shank and East 93rd. Uh, the West End Clubhouse Hotel that was owned by William Warner, and that hotel was one of the few that was still there in 1939. Whitaker's Hotel, owned by John Whitaker. The Ruffle Bar Hotel at Ruffle Bar Island, again, back then, Ruffle Bar was considered part of Canarsie. That was owned by the Schmel family. Uh, the Glanders Assembly Rooms, that was on Conklin off uh, the railroad tracks, um, and that was owned by Richard Glander. You had Kayser's Hotel on 95th and Glenwood Road. That was the, ho the, that was the uh, hotel where the bottom floor um, was used as a courthouse. 
And then you had Shiland's Hotel on Rockaway uh, Parkway um, around Avenue. Well, again, back then that was considered Canarsie Grove. And that was owned by uh, Emil Shiland. Moving on to 1895 to 1899, you had Bodecker's Hotel, Berman's Hotel. Uh, Berman's was on 95th off K, again, Canarsie Grove. You had the White House Hotel. That's where St. Jude's Church is today at the rear lawn. You had the Henry Quarides Hotel at Canarsie Shore. Um, you had the 1898 Annex Hotel that was on the border of Canarsie and Bronzeville. You had Rid uh, Rigby's Hotel. That was owned by uh, George H. Rigby, and then when he passed away, his wife, Mary Rigby, took over. 1899, you had the Roush Hotel. You had the Bayside Hotel and Music Hall. You had the James C. Graham Hotel, Cavanaugh's Hotel, Lisk Hotel, Loader's Hotel. That was owned by Frank Loader. The O'Brien Hotel by John O'Brien. Again, all these hotels were at Canarsie Shore. And uh, you had the Oriental Hotel. That was owned by William Warner. And then you had the Davis Hotel owned by... George W. Davis, again, that was also by the Canarsie Shore. Moving on, 1899 through 1906, Churchill Hotel, Braisted Hotel, that was owned by Garrett Braisted. Palmer's Sunset Hotel, that was owned by Joseph E. Palmer. That was another one of Canarsie's last hotels that was still there in 1939. You had Theodore's Hotel, Mertz Hotel, owned by Joseph Mertz, the Sunset Hotel, the Eagle Hotel. Abraham's Hotel and Bar at Conklin off the railroad tracks. Burkhardt's Hotel, McCarthy's Hotel, both of them at the Canarsie Shore. Biggs All-American Hotel at Rockaway and Schenck. And of course, on the documentary that uh, we made uh, back in 2015, we showed you uh, William Biggs's house and that house was torn down a few months after I filmed it. Um, and that hotel was still there in 1939. Bogle's Oriental Hotel at the Canarsie Shore, that was owned by Fred Bogle. Robinson's Hotel, owned by Howard Robinson. Adam Epic's Hotel, Rockaway and East 95th, owned by John A. Epic. Myers Hotel and Sharpburgers Hotel at Canarsie Shore. Both of them, Myers and Sharpburgers, were at Canarsie Shore. Sharpburger was owned by Charles Sharpburger. 1906 McGirt's Hotel that was at Canarsie Landing. They're gonna pause right here, and I'm gonna tell you why because the hotels that I just listed were 68 hotels. The the reason we're stopping at 1907 is because in 1907 Golden City Park was built, and a lot of people seem to think that the reason Canarsie has so much tourism was because of Canarsie Park, but in fact that wasn't the case. As you can see from 1853 to 1906. 68 hotels existed and Golden City Park had not been built yet. So now we're going into the Golden City Park phase. And of course, a huge amusement park comes. Here come more hotels. You start off with the Empire Hotel, East 92nd and Denton. You got the Diamond Point Hotel off the pier. The new Canarsie Hotel that was near Golden City. And that hotel um, burned down in 1909. It only existed for two years. You have the Messenger Hotel that was located at 2222 Rockaway Parkway. That was owned by Lawrence Messenger. And 2222, if you look at it up in like a Google search, you're going to see that is right near Bell Parkway. That's where Golden City Park was. You had the Golden City Hotel that was owned by William Warner. That was within the Golden City Park itself. You had Mother Faith's Hotel at Schenck and Rockaway. Herman's Hotel owned by A. Uh, B. Herman. Uh, the Canarsie Menneker Hotel. That was at 1434 Rockaway Parkway, um, that was in 1911. Moving on to 1912, you had the Taft Hotel at 1002 Rockaway uh, near the Flatbush Town Line. Now that hotel burned in 1926 where eight people died. That hotel was owned by Julius Taft. I believe that's one of uh, Canarsie's worst disasters where uh, the, loss of, the loss of life um, was... Uh, was a great amount. Moving on to 1914, you had Erhard's uh, Hotel at Avenue G in East 95th. Avenue G is now known as Glenwood Road. That was owned by Philip F. Erhard. And you had Emmerich's Hotel at 1002 Rockway Parkway. And then you had the Weisskopf Hotel at Rockway in East 95th. That was owned by William Weisskopf. 
Moving on to 1914 to 1920, you had Fisher's Hotel. That was located at 2618 Carnarcy Lane. Again, if you do a Google search on that, you're going to see that that's right where the Belt Parkway is. 1914, you had Pilgrim's Hotel at East 95th and Avenue K. Again, that was Carnarcy, uh, Carnarcy Grove area. 1915, Criers Hotel. That was on East 92nd Street, um, and that was owned by Henry Cryer. You had Harms Hotel, Farragut, and Rockaway, right almost directly across the street from where the current fire department is, and that was owned by Frederick W. Harms. 1915, Robertson's Hotel, East 92nd and Denton, Erhard's Hotel, uh, East 95th, um, that was owned by Mark Erhardt. Payex Hotel, East 95th and Avenue K, you know what that is, and that was owned by John D. Payek, and John D. Payek owned the lumber yard where the municipal parking lot is today, where everyone parks their cars uh, in order, you know, where they leave their cars right before they get into the train. That used to be a lumber yard, again, owned by John D. Payek. In 1917, you had the Shore Inn. Um, in 1918, you had the Shapiro Hotel. That's one of the few hotels that was owned by a female. Her name was Bertha Shapiro, and it was located at 2187 Rockway Avenue, or Parkway as we know it uh, today. 1920, Wismeyer's Hotel at Schenck and Rockaway. We're nearing the end here at 1920 with the Mono Hotel. Mike, Michael Mono owned this hotel. He was the first, one of the first few successful Italians, a really successful Italians that was in Canarsie. Um, his hotel burned in 1934. 1921, uh, you had Ray's Hotel. 1936, you had the Bayman's Rest Hotel on Rockaway Parkway. Um, and then the last one, you got the Rugby Hotel. Uh, this hotel, the Rugby Hotel, I named it the Rugby Hotel. This hotel was located on Farragut Road near the Brooklyn Terminal Market. Um, and so what was happening, the reason there was a hotel there, and, and this building is still there um, today, it's actually the same building where Jersey Lynn Farms is. And I know the owner for Jersey Lynn Farms, he gave me a tour of this building. It's amazing, it, you know, if, if you ever get a chance to go into the basement of this building. Um, and so what was happening, the reason there was a hotel there back in those days is because the Long Island Railroad tracks, which are still there, ran passenger trains. And what would happen is there was a stop there. The stop was called the Rugby Stop. It was the Rugby Stop of the Long Island Railroad. And so people would um, get off the train and instead of continuing their trip, if it was late or they were tired, they could stay at that hotel. And I named it the Rugby Hotel. Um, and there you go. You got 100 hotels of Canarsie. And I got to tell you that there probably are more. You know, you just you just research and research and, and you come across 100 hotels. And there were some hotels where I couldn't establish the the um the 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 location or or I couldn't establish its 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 footprint in Canarsie so I didn't list it but I'll I'll guarantee you that I probably that there probably existed 110 115 hotels but these are the hundred that I found and that I verified through my research again researching Canarsie for over 15 years and I hope you enjoyed this historic look into the resorts and tourism industry that, that Canarsie possessed. And remember, as always, there's always more to Canarsie history.